I just finished watching the entire Next.js conference, all 12 hours of video content. I'm going to save you some time. First, I'm going to break down the keynote, all the major announcements that were made. Uh, second, I'm going to talk about some of the sessions that I thought stood out and maybe are worth going back and watching. Something like 27 total sessions. Uh, you don't want to watch them all. And then lastly, I'm going to break down some kind of high-level thoughts of where I think Next.js and Vercel are headed. All right, let's do it. So the keynote really focused on three major buckets of announcements. Uh, the first being TurboPack, which is their successor to Webpack, they're calling it. Uh, the second bucket of announcements is around all the Next 13 core functionality. So all of the new routing capabilities, uh, taking advantage of React 18 features like server components and the unified data fetching. And then that last bucket is just sort of an extension of Next 13 features, and that's the component toolkit. So let's dive deep into TurboPack. TurboPack is Vercel's bundling solution. They're calling it, again, the successor to Webpack. It's really to compete with the Vites of the world, right? They talk about performance quite a lot. Uh, it's 700 times faster than Webpack, which I think is hilarious. Might as well have been a million times faster than Webpack. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but it's 10 times faster than Vite. And this is interesting because w in what scenario? So they're talking about HMR, so hot module reload, like you save a file, how quickly is that re-bundled and live in your dev environment, right? TurboPack will scale better with large projects than Vite. And it's because fundamentally TurboPack is doing a bundle step, which seems counterintuitive to me, but as opposed to Vite leveraging the native browser ESM support, uh, they're actually doing a bundle step and it allows them to, to scale better with a lot of modules, a lot of files. Uh, the examples they use, the benchmarks start at 3000 files. And when I first saw that, I'm imagining my Next.js app in like a pages directory and components directory and there's 3000 files in there. And that just sounds absurd. Like who has projects that big? Uh, but somebody pointed out to me that it's actually including node modules. So now, now it makes a lot more sense uh, because there's like a billion files in node modules, right? Uh, so 3000 files, it's something like 10 times faster than Vite with HMR. Evan Yo did point out, however, uh, that we're going from something like 0.09 seconds with Vite to 0.01 seconds with uh, TurboPack. So is that perceptible? It is performance binary? Is a thing fast or not? In terms of your dev feedback loop, does Vite just check the box and it feels fast and going that 10 times faster at those levels, maybe it just doesn't matter. Maybe you don't feel it. But who knows? We're going to have to see it play out. And I think that's the bigger takeaway that I'm taking from the TurboPack announcement is we got to wait and see. There's so much here. It's an alpha release, so it only works in your dev server. No production builds yet. It's missing some things. You can't use Next Dynamic and like things like Tailwind support uh, aren't there. You have to run like Tailwind's server in a, a sidecar with concurrently. There's a big focus with TurboPack on incremental computation. We only do something once, never do something twice. If you've built a thing, you've done work, you shouldn't do that work again. That's kind of the philosophy. And that's where we get these crazy uh, performance increases along with using these native technologies like Rust. All right, so that's TurboPack. Uh, now let's talk about the second big announcement, which is the Next.js 13 routing features. Let's break it down. I'm gonna try my best. I'll be honest, I've been confused by the React 18 feature set for months. Uh, I've sort of known all this was coming. I've vaguely got an idea about what server components are, uh, but a lot of it has been very fuzzy for me. So seeing this all play out in an actual Next.js app uh, is, is really helpful for me to start to wrap my head around how all this stuff works. So to use the new router in Next.js 13, you're gonna put your files under an app directory instead of the pages directory. And this can be done incrementally, which is super important, I think. Uh, if you've got an existing app, you can literally create an app directory alongside your pages directory and start slowly moving pieces of your application into that app directory to take advantage of all these new routing capabilities. So that's a good call. They're not breaking anything. You can continue to use your pages directory and your API routes and get server-side props and all of these things indefinitely. So within your app directory, you can now create these special named files. So this kind of came in back in Next 12 with middleware, where there's like a specific file name that matters. You have middleware.ts all of a sudden, and that means something depending on what directory it's in. Uh, it's a lot more of that. 
So now inside that app directory, you have layout files at any level of the hierarchy. A layout file sort of represents this server component that handles the layout of your page, right? Uh, and then you have page files, literally named like page.ts, and those represent individual pages. All of your components in this app directory are server components by default. If you want them to be client components, you have to opt into that by putting use client at the top, sort of similar to the syntax for use strict, which is literally like a string at the top of your file. Theoretically, we're building components in React on the server that generate HTML and ship less JavaScript to the client. And then you opt into that, that JavaScript, uh, that rich functionality, you progressively enhance it, if you will, uh, by using client components. Oh, I should also point out that in this new world, you're not really using get server-side props, get static props, uh, or get static paths, you know, the, all the ISR features. All of that is now being molded into this unified fetch. It's really a proprietary fetch that ships in Next. It's sort of a wrapper on top of fetch, and you pass in some options that specify how you want the cache to behave. So instead of doing get server-side props, you now have like a param you're passing to your fetch that sort of tells it not to cache, like a no cache option. All right, so let's talk about that third bucket, the component toolkit. For as long as I've used Next, we've had the image component, which is fantastic. It allows you to not think about all the things you need to do to optimize images for the web, because there's just a whole lot of things that you should be doing. The takeaway I took in terms of improvements to Next Image, they stripped out some of the JavaScript. They're leveraging browser APIs now that allow you to do lazy loading and things like that, which makes it lighter, more accessible, faster, hashtag use the platform. Uh, so that's great. We saw that improvement to Next Image. I think there's some other like quality of life improvements uh, around working with them in terms of like layouts and width and height and all that stuff people have complained about for years. Then there's Next uh, Link. We don't have to put anchor tags in our Next Link anymore, which is cool. It always looked weird to have a little naked anchor tag. Like it made me feel a little better that I was writing something that looked like HTML, uh, but it just felt kind of bizarre. So now you don't have to do that. They obviously render an anchor tag, but we're not having to put those inside the link component. So that's great. And then next font. I swear, this is probably the most excited I got in the entire conference is next slash font. It's a new component that they've added. Choose a Google font or other fonts. I think you can do custom fonts even, and it will just do all the right things. If you want to do the absolute best thing, you don't want to just take the tag that like Google fonts gives you like a script tag that you can drop on your page and and like do the bad thing. You don't wanna do that. You wanna self-host them, you wanna preload them, you wanna inline the CSS, you wanna optionally whatever, load the font, all those things that make it really do well in terms of you know core web vitals and all that. Uh, now we have next slash font that just does all that for you. You can literally import your font, like enter, like using barrel imports from next font which is not dissimilar to some other third-party solutions, I think. But now it's built in as a next component that we can use. And to me, the best part is there's no layout shift. So I always hated the best font strategy really from a performance standpoint is optional. The problem with that is most people will hit your site once and then that top of the funnel will never come back. And they'll never see your cool font if the font didn't load fast enough to be rendered before the default is rendered. Uh, that's just the nature of optional. So we get some performance, but we lose that customization. We lose that custom font for a whole lot of our visitors. Uh, if you use swap, then you get layout shift, and that's just bad. You don't want to see the page jump as soon as the, the new font loads. So this next slash font uh, component allows us to completely avoid layout shift using a CSS property, and I forgot the name, uh, but basically a way to like, for each font, calculate the distance the margins to like normalize the size of all fonts so that they can basically swap in the font without any layout shift. Super cool, very excited about that. Now all your visitors can see your custom font as soon as it's available and downloaded uh, and not experience layout shift. It's just all the best of all the worlds, love it. Overall, really excited about these additions. Honestly, these are the types of things that'll keep me using Next. Like I was probably on the fence about, do I wanna keep using Next.js in the future? Sending all this JavaScript, I don't know, I hear that's bad. Maybe I should be using HTML first frameworks like Astro. But it's these types of things, like next slash font. Seems like such a dumb little thing, but it'll keep me using next. And for that, I think it's brilliant that they invest in this component toolkit. All of these changes with next image and the new next font component 
All of that can be added to your applications with Next 13 without using the new layouts, the new routing stuff. So you don't have to use the app directory to take advantage of those new components. That might've been obvious, but I thought it was a good call out. I heard Lee Rob say it. Uh, so, you know, you can take advantage of this new next font thing just by upgrading to next 13. Uh, you don't have to roll into the new data fetching and react 18 stuff. There were like 27 sessions, individual breakout sessions across two stages. And you don't want to go back and watch them all. I promise you it's a mixed bag, uh, but there were some fantastic sessions. And I want to talk about some of the ones that stood out to me in no particular order. Uh, first, on the J stage, really the first two sessions were some of the best. Uh, first was Maya Teagarden, works at Vercel. Uh, she's been heavily involved in building out TurboPack and she laid out really more of the case for why build another bundler uh, and went into more depth, kind of what is TurboPack, some of the underlying architectural decisions. Uh, so a deeper dive, it really felt like reading the docs in a lot of ways, uh, but it also felt like, uh, you know, when like the marketing people announce a thing, it's like, Turbo Pack, and it's all the things that you expect on a marketing landing page and all that. And, and then the developer comes in and kind of sets expectations. That's what this was. Maya was very much bringing us down to earth. If you're a real developer here and you're listening to this, you're wanting to know like, but what is it really and, and where is it really? And she set a much more, I think, realistic expectation for the timeline uh, and for kind of the scope of the undertaking, just how big of an undertaking this is. I also want to call out that uh, they missed an opportunity here to put Maya in one of those amazing rooms and do the video production thing that they did with like Lee Rob, uh, because she could have had that moment like the Apple Silicon guy, the guy that does all the processor stuff at Apple, and he sits in that room and it's like all the cool processor stuff happening in the background. That's this moment. I mean, that's what TurboPack really, the metaphor is so strong in my mind, and the Apple ties with Vercel are so strong just throughout this whole conference. But. Uh, really, that's what this was. This was like they cut to that guy who's talking about how much faster M1 processors are. That was Maya laying out the case for TurboPack. Excellent session. The next one right after that was uh, Sam Selikoff, who's the founder of Build UI, which I'd never heard of. I've seen his face on Twitter. Uh, excellent job, Sam. Seriously, fantastic. And if you just listen to me botch, the definition of Next.js 13 routing and all the React 18 stuff and layouts and composable layouts, all that stuff, go watch Sam's video. It's not that long and he he did such a great job of really breaking down what this looks like in practice. Uh, he's really good at this stuff. It just kind of made me wonder why I'm doing any of what I'm doing because I think a better version of me already exists. His name is Sam buildui.com, check it out. Uh, the next talk I wanna talk about, Chris Bautista did, uh, Trash Dev, did uh, making TypeScript, or TypeSafe APIs easy with TRPC. Uh, this one wasn't all that long. I really recommend you go watch it, very entertaining. If you've watched Trash on Twitch or anywhere else, uh, you'll know he's, he's, a, he's a funny guy. And the TRPC example was fantastic, concise, entertaining. Uh, and yeah, I just, I recommend you check it out. And also Flip, I see you. That was an excellent edit. Uh, one of the more like entertaining sessions out of all the sessions. Uh, the next one I'll talk about right after that was Next.js as a backend framework with Theo. I mean, Theo's Theo, so obviously you should go watch it. You probably already watched it. Uh, but I thought it was a good, like kind of controversial take, but he made sense. So it's hard to fight him on it. Uh, it is just funny to me the whole backend argument with Next.js. Uh, I'll get to it later, but Kelsey Hightower did like a, a live fire talk or fire, fire, uh, fire, fire table open. What is, what is fireplace talk fire? What do, you, what do you call that? A fireside chat. That's it. He did a fireside chat with Guillermo and uh, he mentioned something about being a front end conference. I just think like, Next.js is a back-end framework if you're a front-end dev. I don't mean that in a demeaning way. Uh, I think front-end dev is harder than back-end dev. So I honestly, I don't mean it. It's like uh, you guys, you front-end developers would think that, but it is sort of uh, an interesting take. I think it's worth watching, dissecting everything he says there. Next, oh, maybe, I think this was my favorite talk in the whole conference, all 12 hours of talks. Uh, Yuna, uh, who is a Google Chrome staff developer, Yuna Kravitz, did a talk, what's new in web UI. And she basically broke down, I think it was six new or 
slightly new, like ranging from like it's established to it's still not quite supported, but it's worth keeping an eye on features in CSS that are coming to the browser. Some of this stuff was so cool to, and to see her, how excited she was about it. And, and the example she used were so real. Sometimes you see like new features for a thing coming out and the examples are so contrived and they, they just honestly like, who would be building that? Her examples were all fantastic. She cited all these sources of more examples. Uh, but these CSS features, she made me want to write CSS. And like, I'm a Tailwind Homer, a Tailwind Andy. I don't think about writing straight CSS, but she made me want to. It was a fantastic talk. I really recommend if you're a web developer, you build anything for the browser, go check it out. Uh, fantastic talk. I'll try to have links for all of these talks that I'm recommending in the description. The next one I wanna talk about is Excaladraw, under the hood of the virtual whiteboard with Christopher uh, Shadow. And I didn't know Christopher made Excaladraw as a side project. I thought Excaladraw was some startup. I had no idea. And this is just me being out of touch probably. You may have known this, but he's a, an engineer at Meta and all of Excaladraw is this super cool open source story and this side project that he built and, and like all of it, the whole story was fantastic. It was such good storytelling. Uh, that was my big takeaway from that talk is like at every turn, every sentence, I was just like being sucked into this open source success story and how they built it. He goes into the kind of the architecture of Excaladraw and how they do end-to-end -end encryption for security and and then how they built like sort of a commercial offering on top of it. It was just made me a huge, even huger, if you will, fan of Excaladraw. Super good talk. Next was building a design system in Next.js with Tailwind, with True, Mew True on Twitch and elsewhere. I'm a big True fan, so uh, I knew I'd like this talk, but she's just really good at being practical, being very like approachable, the way she lays out information, just excellent. And design systems are something, I can't get enough content around how to do proper design system stuff. She was doing things with variants in Tailwind and TypeScript that I've never seen. And I feel like I need to watch that talk like three times and start putting some of that into place because it did seem like a much better workflow when you're building out components. The last one that I have is the future of the web from cloud to edge uh, with Kelsey Hightower and Guillermo. This one was incredible. It's like an hour and a half, so it's longer, but it's this fireside chat of these two sitting on the stage. And Kelsey is just, he's such a treasure. Uh, I think Guillermo called him, did he call him magnificent? I can't remember the word. It was it was an awesome word. Uh, he He's just, if you've not watched Kelsey Hightower speak, you just instantly fall in love with Kelsey Hightower. He, he's so real. All of his questions felt very unscripted. I don't know if they had planned talking points ahead of time and just to keep things on track, like to not risk anything, but it felt like his questions were very sincere and off the top of his head. And I felt like it was a really good look into, I mean, aside from just getting to listen to Kelsey talk, it was a really good look into how Guillermo thinks about Vercel and how he's thought about it to this point and, and the decisions they've made and, and how he views the value proposition. Uh, it was just excellent. And if you're like a cloud nerd like me, you'll, you'll love, the, the whole thing. Just listening to Kelsey talk about his perspective of Next. He's an advisor to Vercel, which I didn't know. Uh, yeah, really enjoyed it. Was nerding out over that one. It is an hour and a half, so uh, you'll want to block off some time for that one. But there were a lot of uh, other sessions I'm not calling out that were worth watching. Uh, there were a lot that honestly weren't to me. It's the whole like advertisement for a thing. And I'm sure Vercel had to, they got to do that. Like they got to let people I don't know, do they get paid for these? I don't know, like there's some commercials in the form of talks, uh, but these that I just highlighted, you can't go wrong. I, I really recommend watching all of them. All right, so some of my high level thoughts about Vercel and Next.js coming out of the conference. Uh, one, I think this was just an incredible production. There were so many parallels, people throwing out there to Apple, some funny, uh, <laughs> uh, but really like, it's a testament to they've gotten a lot of things right at Vercel and they've clearly got a great design team. They've invested a lot in doing these live events and doing them well. I think there's some like rough edges. They'll get better at it over time. I think even Apple, you know, their first conferences didn't look as great as they do today. Uh, so they'll grow into that. And I hope that these are a fixture every year that we just keep seeing them raise the bar in terms of uh, a quality event like this. Uh, Next, my, my overall thought on like the web landscape is sort of seeing how the bundle wars play out. Uh, it's interesting that 
you know, Vercel did make a very deliberate decision to build everything internally and to not use Vite, where the rest of the community seems to be sort of uh, kind of piling into Vite. So it'll be interesting to see. Does SvelteKit end up using Turbo Pack in the future? These kind of questions, it's really interesting to see it all play out. Um, but it's exciting. I mean, if our dev environment, everything gets faster, our production builds take way less time, these are all fantastic things to hope for in the future. Uh, but then there's the question of sort of complexity. And as you watch the Next.js conf, it's hard not to start feeling like, I'm confused, and is it my fault? Or have we created a world where there's a lot of confusion and just so many layers now of abstraction? I mean, the whole concept of transpilation and bundling and all these compile steps and minification and all this stuff that happens, it does start to feel like a lot to wrap your head around. And then you introduce app level stuff, features in React 18 with server components and the distinction between React and Vercel and Next.js. It just all becomes a lot of cognitive overhead. And there are people on the other side of the fence who would say, just write simple stuff, you know? And there's a whole movement toward HTML first and uh, minimalism and shipping a lot less JavaScript. The fact that there have been community murmurs that the bundles aren't any smaller going to the client with, with Next.js 13, th those are concerning. And I hope that all of this uh, plays out in the way that we've kind of been promised with React 18. Uh, but that that's sort of an underlying undercurrent of, do, do we need all of this complexity? How does it all play out in the end? Are we converging? Are we moving away from React as an industry? Uh, or is React here to stay for the next decade? These are all questions in my mind. And it's hard not to think through the lens of Twitter when I'm watching a conference like this, where there are a lot of vocal advocates for simpler solutions. I think Vercel would say, you need all these abstractions to build stuff that scales from tiny projects to huge mega projects. And I think there's surely something to that. Time will tell. And that's the big takeaway I think for this whole conference is, uh, we're at the beginning of some major changes. This is a big turning point in the web. I feel like there is a sea change. It's just, it's unclear where we're headed yet. I guess just bet on JavaScript. That's what they say, right? Is that accurate? Can I just say bet on JavaScript? Could we just wrap it up that way? All right, I'm done.